Hello and welcome to Plugged In. I'm Greta Van Susteren. On our show this week, we take a deep look at climate change. Whether you think it's a hoax or whether you side with the vast majority of scientists, the evidence shows our planet is changing. Sea levels rising and the planet is getting hotter. According to NASA, the U.S. Space Agency, the Earth's average surface temperature is now nine-tenths of a degree hotter than average. An increase of one degree Celsius may not seem like much, but most scientists say that the one degree warmer is melting polar ice caps, endangering wildlife and people living along the world's coast. Earth's climate has been changing as long as it's been spinning on its axis. But why is it changing? Is it the natural ebb and flow of time passing? Or is it, as most scientists insist, increased human activity? And the very disturbing question, is it already too late to do anything about it? We are live on Facebook at Voice America, and we would love to hear your comments and your questions. So here's a fact for you to ponder. The five hottest years on record have all taken place in this decade, and the decade's not over. According to the United Nations, 2018 was the fourth hottest year on record, casting the spotlight on the impact of climate change on people and politics. VOA environmental correspondent Steve Baragona reports. In November, California's deadliest wildfire on record killed 88 people, a grim example of consequences on a warming planet. The state's fires are getting worse, says former wildfire fighting chief Ken Pimlot. Things are changing. The, the folks can say what they want to say, but when uh, firefighters are living climate change, it's, it's staring them in the face every day. In September, Hurricane Florence's record-breaking rains caused massive flooding in North Carolina. Fire at one extreme, water at the other, like the difference between where the world is headed and where it needs to be. UN scientists issued a sobering report ahead of December's climate talks in Poland. Ho Sung Lee shared the panel. It shows that the window to limit warming to 1.5 degree is narrow, that it would require a net global emissions of carbon dioxide to fall by about 45% by 2030. Every year matters. But this year, emissions rose by an estimated 2.7%, the biggest jump since 2011. U.S. government scientists published an equally stark report in November on the impacts of climate change on the nation. President Donald Trump rejected it. I don't believe it. You don't believe it? No, no, I don't believe it. Trump told VOA that cutting emissions would be too expensive. I'm not going to put the country out of business trying to maintain certain standards that probably don't matter. When you look at China and when you look at other countries where they have very, you know, foul air, they have not good air, we're going to be clean, but they're not, and it costs a lot of money. But Trump's efforts to loosen regulations on producing and burning fossil fuels have met with mixed results so far, says the Natural Resources Defense Council's Jake Schmidt. The good news is that a number of those are being held up in court. Uh, the progress is a bit slower in terms of unwinding them, uh, but clearly everything that's been on the climate action agenda for the last couple of years, the Trump administration is trying to undo. Trump's Republican Party lost control of the House of Representatives in the midterm elections. That will mean more pushback from Democrats on climate and much more in 2019. The entire Congress must work to put an end to the inaction and denial of science that threaten the planet and the future. Meanwhile, Trump's hostility toward climate science did not stop UN negotiators from reaching a deal in December on a rule book for carrying out the Paris Climate Agreement. Critics say it does not go nearly far enough, but getting everyone on board was not easy, says meeting chair Michal Kurtika. In these circumstances, every single step forward is a big achievement. And through this package, you have made a thousand little steps forward together. But step forward carefully, experts warn. Raising fuel taxes to fight climate change helped bring yellow vest protesters to the streets in France. Who will pay the cost of climate action as the bill for past inaction comes due? It's a question for 2019 and beyond. And for more on the Paris Climate Agreement and what we can expect in 2019, we are joined by VOA science supporter Steve Baragona. Nice to see you, Steve. Good to see you. Um, Steve, are the goals that were set by the, um, in Paris, have they been met by the nations that are still signatories to this? No. Uh, in a word, no. Um, basically, at this point, if countries were to keep up their pledges, 
uh, the planet would warm about three degrees. Now, the Paris Agreement uh, said that the goal was to keep warming to well below two degrees. So even if countries met their pledges, we wouldn't keep the planet below that, that uh, critical threshold. And what we're seeing is that countries have not kept up their word on the things that they pledged to do. We're already seeing in the US, for example, uh, emissions are going up. Uh, in China, emissions are going up. Uh, around the world, emissions are going up. There are very few places where emissions are going down, and almost nowhere are they going down in line with what countries said they would do in Paris. All right, if the threshold was two, two um, and, and uh, three was what was set in the Paris Agreement, why didn't they set it at two? Just because it would have such an enormous economic impact that nobody could, re could uh, deliver the, on the two? Two degrees is a little bit arbitrary, but there are certain thresholds that the science um, at the time of Paris said uh, for example, uh, coral reefs uh, are likely to more or less disappear at two degrees. Um, there are a number of kind of tipping points uh, of melting of the Arctic um, and certain ecosystems that scientists say can't really take more than two degrees. So two degrees was kind of set as a uh, somewhat arbitrary limit. It's not like the world ends if we go to 2.1 and we're saved if we go to 1.9. Bad things will happen up to two degrees. It's just that after two degrees, things appear to get quite a bit worse. What's the impact of the United States, actually President Trump, pulling out of the Paris Agreement? Well, it depends. Uh, so far, not a lot. Um, so. The United States has made certain pledges to reduce its emissions by, I believe the numbers are 26 to 28 percent. There are economic forces that are already pushing the U.S. in that direction. Um, coal is, is leaving the grid. Coal-fired power plants are shutting down left, right, and center. The coal industry, most experts say, is not coming back. And coal is the dirtiest, most polluting form of, of energy. Natural gas is replacing it. The latest data that just came out yesterday basically say that natural gas is replacing coal to such an extent that our emissions are tracking upward again. But is it part of the issue is that, um, that we may, the plants may be closing down, but as the economy hums and buzzes that you have more trucks on the road and you have, um, and people have jobs and so you get more emissions that way as you get a more vibrant, robust economy? If you're continuing to use fossil fuels, yes. Uh, there's been an effort to try to what they call uh, was it uh, de-link the emissions from economic growth? And there are ways you can do that if you have more uh, alternative energy, more wind, more solar, more battery power, more electric vehicles on the road. The hope is that even with more economic growth, you don't get the same levels of, of greenhouse gas emissions. Now that, uh, that transition is starting, but it's got a long ways to go before it, it makes a significant dent in emissions. And there is a cost even with uh, using like electric cars is that, you know, how do you get the electricity? Still got to get the electricity Still, from somewhere. And that has carbon emissions with that. If you're getting it from coal or gas, yes. And as you try to, and as the, I suppose the Trump administration tries to make a more robust economy and rolls back regulations even on things like fuel, that of course uh, raises the emissions. Unless you're able to decouple, as I said. But yes, yeah, so far that's been one of the biggest drivers of the emissions now under the, the system that we have now that depends on fossil fuels. You get a, a healthier economy, you get more, more emissions. Steve, thank you. Nice thank to see you. you. So what is the U.S. position on climate change? Well, late last year, a landmark report compiled by more than a dozen federal agencies and more than 300 authors released a 1,000-page document called the National Climate Assessment. The report's findings were stark, describing the impact of climate change in specific regions of the country as a menace that threatens the well-being of the United States and everyone who lives here. The Trump administration has largely ignored its own agency findings, downplaying the significance of man-made climate change to favor a, favor a more business-friendly approach, while at the same time casting doubt on the report's conclusions and the certainty of climate science, despite the growing mountain of evidence. Thus, the consensus of most climate scientists is herself a scientist. Dr. Judith Curry is president and co-founder of the Climate Forecast Applications Network. She's also a former professor and chair at the School of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences and the Georgia Institute of Technology and a member of the National Research Council's Climate Research Committee. She's also the co-author of two books on the physics of climate. Dr. Curry joins us via Skype from Phoenix, Arizona. Welcome, Dr. Curry. 
Thank you for having me, Greta. Yeah. Okay, now there's no question about it. There's a, I mean, that you are, I think, it's fair to say, are in the minority about what's causing global warming or climate change. Um, I think, but correct me if I'm wrong, is that you assign less responsibility to to man, to to people, and in, in uh, to causing it, and more to just natural ebb and, and flow. Is that right? Um, that's correct. You know, on the time scales that we're looking at, a few decades, um, the ocean circulations really have a big control on the climate, and the deep ocean and the and, and these are very slow circulations. The deep ocean and the Pacific. Um, is still cooling. It's responding to what's was going on in the little ice age. So there's um, simply relating warmer temperatures to CO2 emissions is vastly oversimplified. Are, are you denying that uh, that these emissions cause global warming? Are you saying that you just don't assign as much influence to them as other scientists? Or are you saying that they don't have any impact on global warming? Oh, oh, oh they impact. Okay, it's. Oh, that there's no question that all things being equal, um, more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere will have a warming effect. The issue is how much and how important is that relative to the natural variations in the climate. And that we're seeing um, started in about 1860, as we were coming out of the Little Ice Age. And it, the rate of sea level rise in the 1930s and 40s is as high as we were seeing now. Now, the carbon dioxide emissions didn't really kick in in a big way until 1950. So there was a lot of warming happening before the CO2 emissions really kicked in. Well, in, in light of fact, I'm, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, you dispute what I think most, I think most scientists disagree with you, but in, but in light of the fact that you do admit that, see, that these emissions do have an impact on climate change, um, I do see, I mean, I, I take it that you would support any efforts to reduce these emissions that contribute to climate change. Sure, if they're um, overall environmentally friendly, they're economical, and they don't jeopardize, um, glo you know, energy security and availability, why not? But trying to impose these arbitrary timescales using technologies that aren't up to the task doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I've, I've read that you mock the people who, who believe these, these scientists and almost call them alarmists. Is that a, is that a fair uh, statement? I, I, of people. I try to keep my demeanor uh, very uh, professional in my public communications. Um, people who, th there are some people who say completely crazy things that are well beyond anything stated by these assessment reports, and I don't know what you want to call that. And then there are people on the other side who say completely stupid things. Um, but there is, you know, within the scientifically defensible literature and discourse, there are a range of perspectives. How do you explain the correlation, at least the, I've read the correlation, that since in the 1950s we've had greater emissions, we've had a much more uh, dependence on fossil fuels since the 1950s, as well as in the last few years where the economy in the last couple of years has been more robust and people are taking more to trains, to airplanes, everything else, that the emissions have risen. Um, do you assign no sort of significance to that? No, I'm not saying it doesn't influence the climate. I'm saying you have to look at all the warming that happened before 1950 and ask what caused that. And are those same factors still in play in the current warming? Well, yes, they are, but CO2 is also contributing. This isn't an either or natural versus human caused. It's a combination of both. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Whether you agree with the consensus of the science community that climate change is due to human activity, climate change poses a serious threat to much of the world, especially many of the regions that Voice of America covers. Here's a roundup from some of our VOA correspondents on the clear and present danger posed by changing climate around the globe. Khalid from Voice of America, Urdu Service. Pakistan, a country of over 200 million people, has been hardly contributing to the global warming up to 1%. But when it comes to the adversities, Pakistan is in the top 10 most vulnerable countries through climate change. That has been said in a recent Global Climate Index 2019 report. 
Recent heat waves in Karachi, receding glaciers and shrinking water supplies have significantly impacted the country's agro-based economy. And as per the experts, it's only going to go worse. Pakistan's forest cover is diminishing and hundreds of acres of coastal land are being lost each year. Asian Development Bank warns that part of country are likely to suffer bigger temperature increases in coming years and it has warned that rising temperatures could affect the efficiency of the country's nuclear plants as well. Experts say extreme climate change events such as heavy rains will also cause major flooding and damage to the power and transportation infrastructure in fact. Even as cost of natural calamities takes an increasingly heavy toll on nation's economy. I'm Asan ul Haq from Voice of America, Bangla Service. Climate change is affecting some countries more than others. Bangladesh is one of them. It's a small country in size but very densely populated. The land is flat and very close to sea level. In the next few decades, sea level is expected to rise and the prediction is large part of the low-lying southern region of the country will be under saline water. Millions of people dependent on agriculture will lose their home, land, livestock and practically everything. The country is already experiencing drought, flood, heat wave, epidemic of contagious diseases almost every year. Climate change is an increasing threat for millions of people in Bangladesh. Last year, when the White House announced that the U.S. was no longer a party to the Paris Climate Agreement, many Africans expressed dismay. Sub-Saharan Africa, that contributes less than 4% of the global polluters, according to the UN Carbon Emissions Data of year 2000, it carries the most burden of the changing climate. A panel of African leaders who gathered in Copenhagen for the 15th COP managed to strike a deal with world powers to raise a $100 billion annual assistance by the year 2020. However, in almost 10 years, many countries are lagging behind meeting their pledges. I'm Stella Xu with VOA's Mandarin Service. The Chinese have become increasingly aware of climate change in recent years. Scientists warned that without heavy reductions in CO2, China's northern plant, including the capital, Beijing, will see increasingly hotter and more humid summer. Well, China remains among the world's largest CO2 emitter and also the biggest consumer of coal. But the government has started to see climate change as an environmental and economic issue. The government has been investing heavily on renewable energy and clean coal technology. Can more be done? The consensus is yes. In a 2017 survey, 97% of Chinese say they believe climate change is real, and 66% say they believe it is linked to human activities. Most people say they will support stricter regulations on coal. How soon will these policies become law remains to be seen. But right now, that's a general consensus in China. Now back to plug in. Thank you. And climate change poses serious challenges to the world's fastest growing continent, Africa. In sub-Saharan Africa, climate change is seen as a threat to food security because of the region's dependence on rain-fed agriculture. In Kenya, the Ministry of Agriculture estimates that in the past year alone, the adverse effects of climate change has led to losses of more than 50 percent in yields for major crops. And as VOA's Ryle Umbor reports, it is the small farms and the subsistence farmers who suffer the greatest hardships. Justice Mbidi a farmer earns his living from tending to smallholder farms in Kenya's Machakos County. He says crop production has declined over the years. Earlier this year, all the farms that he tends to were ravaged by flooding that affected many parts of Eastern Africa. He says farmers suffered great losses. In March, the area was flooded. The farms were flooded. The place could not be accessed. People were being rescued from their farms by helicopters because the water was all over. Dr. John Recher is a research scientist with the Climate Change, Agriculture and Food Security Program. Typically, of late, the rainfall seasons are starting late and also seizing early. 
which means the length of growing period for any given crop is mostly getting shortened. In Muranga County, Benson Kamura was taking advantage of the floods by storing water in a reservoir that he dug by himself after years of experiencing little and reliable or no rain at all in his home area. The seasons have changed. Sometimes you get rain for a month and then it's over. Sometimes you get too much rain than expected, like what happened in the last season. When the rains prolong and are too much, crops get destroyed. The rains that also come for small periods also hurt the farmers. So for us, irrigation is what will help us now. Kamura is one of the thousands of smallholder farmers in Kenya who are having a hard time adapting to the effects of climate change, so they innovate ways to deal with the changes. His reservoir, he says, holds more than 9,000 liters of water and he regets his farm during the dry seasons. He grows tomatoes, chilies and other vegetables, all the while battling various crop diseases. Recha says frequent dry spells and flooding combine to threaten food security in Africa. Some smallholder farmers are now working to combat climate change through agroforestry. In Muranga and other parts of the country, farmers are incorporating the cultivation and conservation of trees with other crops on their land. The issue is what it is that even African governments and individuals alike can be able to do to be able to start thinking of you know, combating the effects of climate change. And I think some of the issues that are really bring about climate change, they are issues of our own making, like cutting down of trees. I mean, it is something that we don't require external support to be able to do. We can plant our own trees and you know, create forest cover. For smallholder farmers, especially those who rely on rain-fed agriculture, climate change continues to pose a significant challenge to livelihoods in the region. However, there is a glimmer of hope as farmers are now rising and building adaptive capacity in countering the effects. Raya Lombor for VOA News, Nairobi. Is it too late to reverse the effects of climate change or are so-called solutions too expensive? According to my next guest, the price of inaction is far greater than the cost of taking action. Dr. Michael E. Mann is Distinguished Professor of Atmospheric Science at Pennsylvania State University. He's also the director of the Pennsylvania State Earth System Science Center, ESSC, and has won numerous awards for his work in science. Dr. Michael E. Mann joins us via Skype from State College, Pennsylvania. Welcome, sir. Uh, thanks, Greta. It's great to be with you. You know, it strikes me that I mean, I know that you, you know that uh, your your position and that of most scientists is that uh, is that we hu humans are creating this uh, climate change with the CO2 emissions. But what strikes me is that is the industrial nations which are doing that are having impact on even some nations and some people who aren't industrial nations aren't even using much power, if any at all, and yet it affects their food supply, right? That, that's right. That's one of the fundamental injustices of climate change. Uh, those of us who primarily have created the problem, industrial nations like the United States, Europe, etc., um, aren't the ones who are going to be hit the hardest by climate change. The ones who are going to be hit the hardest are those who have the least resilience, um, who have the least uh, resources um, to insulate them from the effects of climate change, and that is the developing world, yeah. Africa and other nations that uh, have not yet achieved sort of the economic wealth that the industrial world has achieved. You know, the question everyone poses, you know, or the post I did a moment ago, is it too late? And when I hear the, the times, I mean, sometimes I hear, you know, by the year 2075, and we all do the math and think, well, I'm not going to be alive, maybe my kids won't even be alive. How, how do you in any way get the message to people in industrial nations that this matters when, you know, we like our cars, we like to be warm in the winter, you know, we like all these things. I mean, how do you communicate the message to them that we need to look at this now? Yeah, well, you know, we don't like we don't like unprecedented wildfires and floods and heat waves and droughts. And so the impacts of climate change are no longer subtle. We're seeing them play out um, in terms of weather disasters that are costing us hundreds of billions of dollars. The problem is that we haven't yet and we all can take some collective responsibility for that. The scientific community, the media haven't yet really connected the dots for the public and help them understand that the disasters that we are now seeing play out in real time are a consequence of our continued burning of fossil fuels and the climate change that that is causing. When we look at renewables like wind and solar, you know, the first question is how much can we store? Where are we on battery storage? Yeah, well, it, this, this myth um, that um, uh, 
goes that, you know, uh, the problem with renewables is that the sun isn't always shining, the wind isn't always blowing, and so uh, we have this problem with the intermittency of the available uh, energy sources. But it turns out that um, if you take all of the available renewable energy sources, that's wind, solar, geothermal, um, and you put it all together in the form of, say, a smart grid, uh, you don't really have that intermittency problem. Now, battery technology is an important part of it. Um, if you have solar panels on your uh, roof, for example, um, it's very useful to have a high battery capacity so you can run your appliances, you can generate electricity when the sun isn't shining. But ultimately, in terms of the power grid, this isn't a fundamental limitation. It's simply a matter of scaling up the technology that already exists, the wind, the solar, and, and all the other forms of renewable energy so that we have this uh, capacity in the form of a smart grid to provide consistent, um, clean, and cheaper energy. You know, many, many people would like to get their carbon footprint down. And let me give you a personal story. Is that we have solar panels on our house that have been there since October, and getting through sort of the regulation in the District of Columbia, Washington, D.C., where I live, we, can't, we still ha can't get ours up and operable running because we have so many hurdles to get people to come out and inspect. So it's not, I mean, even sort of the encouragement to do some of these things is sometimes thwarted by rules and regulations. Yeah, that's true, but um, it's also important to realize that uh, some of that thwarting has been done by special interest fossil fuel interests, um, uh, groups like ALEC, which have actually tried to prevent the passage of policies at the state level that incentivize um, how, how people's you, choices to get renewable energy, for example, solar panel uh, tax credits. Uh, um, let me, yep. let me ask you another quick question. Is that co um, coal mines have been closing at a faster rate under the Trump administration than the Obama administration, yet it's reported that U.S. carbon emissions in, in 2018 were up 3.4 percent, stemming, I guess, primarily from a robust economy. Um, how do you tell people, how do you explain this to people? Can people want jobs? Yeah. Well, you know, for three years straight, we actually saw flat carbon emissions and a growing global economy. And that demonstrated that, in fact, you can grow the economy without increasing carbon emissions. We were doing it for several years, um, but something very unfortunate happened um, in the form of a president of the United States, Donald Trump, who threatened to pull out of the Paris Agreement. Now, uh, your previous correspondent said, well, that probably didn't have that much of an influence, but it did in terms of sort of the global politics of this issue. By Trump threatening to pull out of Paris, it sent a signal to other countries like China that, hey, if the U.S. isn't taking this seriously, why should we take this seriously? And indeed, in the wake of that threat and that decision, we have seen global carbon emissions go up. But they had flatlined for several years. We can do it. We can bend that curve downward. We Do just have to commit ourselves. Dr. Judith uh, uh, Curry isn't here. She was just on the show. She says that it's sort of the natural progression um, of the, the, the world has been changing for years, up and down, warm. Uh, I take you disagree with her. Yeah, it's unfortunate. She promoted a number of myths uh, in her segment. And uh, perhaps the most egregious of them was the one you just cited. Because, in fact, if you look at the effect of natural factors, like small changes in the the brightness of the sun, which we can measure with satellites, um, and volcanic eruptions. These are natural factors that can influence the climate. And if you look at the past half century, those natural factors were actually slightly pushing us in the opposite direction, temporarily towards cooling. So we overcame what would have been a slight natural cooling trend to yes. warm as much as we have, the opposite of what Judith Curry told your viewers. Well, it's a, it's a big topic, and we probably should have both of you on for a longer discussion, uh, but that's one of the problems with TV is that you run short of time. And uh, thank you for joining us. That's all thank the time you. we have for today. Stay plugged in by liking us on Facebook at Voice of America. You can also like my Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash Greta and follow me on Twitter at Greta. Thank you for being plugged in.